into this house of words Think of all these walls have heard Little cherub fighting sleep Creeps from bed while all's asleep Watches ships go sailing by Hello, America, Marie, a dear girl, Dewey, happy O Van Gaini, Dylan Thomas. Hello, America, Marie, a very happy St. David's Day to you from the birthplace of Wales' most famous poet, Dylan Thomas. My name is Alan Gibbard. I am an author, and prior to that, I was in broadcasting for many years. And a major part of my life as a writer and broadcaster has involved Dylan Thomas. I produced documentary programmes on him. I produced a commercially available video. I've been involved in a theatre production on Dylan's life. And I've also do a lot of work here in Dylan Thomas's birthplace. I show people around, tell them the story of the house, tell them the story of Dylan's life. And I also do a lot of schools work, which is really exciting because it means I can introduce a brand new generation to Wales's most famous poet. In the night, looking out over Swansea Bay, dreams of where he'll sail one day. This is the home of Dylan Thomas, Wales's most famous poet, whose work is still loved and enjoyed in many countries around the world, even though he died in 1953. Dylan's mum and dad, DJ and Florrie, first moved into this house in August 1914. At that time, this was a brand new build house, and it was a big step for a teacher in a grammar school to want to move to a house as grand and as big as this one. There was a reason for that. DJ Thomas was a very gifted English student. He had a first class honours degree from Aberystwyth University in Mid Wales. And usually anybody who had that kind of qualification would walk in immediately to a university job. But Dylan's father was turned down for every university job he tried for. And there was a reason for that. There was a problem that was stopping him having what was rightfully his. He was from a working class background. His dad was a guard on the railroad. And as a result, the university people decided that they did not want somebody from such a background to be in the corridors of academia. Dylan's father was naturally very disappointed and a little bit bitter that that was the case. He ended up then teaching in a school for boys. That was not what he expected to do. As a result, he then thought, I am going to grab some place in society for myself that I feel I have been denied. So he thought, I'm going to buy a brand new house in an up-and-coming area of Swansea, the town where he lived at the time. And that's what he did. This was way above a teacher's salary, but he stretched the family income and the family resources. Fate also played its part. A relative of his wife, Florrie, Dylan's mum, passed away at the time they were thinking of moving and left her some money. So when they paid £500 for this house, they were able to pay it down £150 against that. That made it easier for them to take the step up that they wanted to make. So they moved in. Mum, Dad and their eight-year-old daughter, Nancy. Florrie at the time was heavily pregnant. And in October 1914, Dylan Thomas was born in this house, in the room upstairs. That first Christmas, therefore, they were in a new home with a new baby just at the very beginning of World War I. That was the beginning of Dylan's life. When Dylan's family moved into here, Dylan's father stretched the family finances even further. He knew, of course, that if he wanted to climb even further up the social ladder, in addition to buying a house as new and as modern as this, if you had maids, then you would go up one or two steps higher on that ladder. So that's exactly what he did. He had a maid who came in every Monday to wash all the clothes in the washroom at the back of the garden. And there was a maid who came in here Monday to Friday to cook and to clean. 
So this is the family picture that's developing. Dylan here with his mum and dad, a sister eight years older than him, and two maids. I think it's safe to say that Dylan wanted for nothing. He went to the school where his father was an English master, but Dylan had already decided in his young adolescent mind that he was going to be a poet. And as a result, he didn't bother with any subject in school other than English. Top of the class in English, bottom of the class in every other subject. For Dylan, it wasn't a matter of ability at all. He was gifted enough. But he thought, if I'm going to be a poet, what do I need chemistry for? And therefore, he didn't bother. The result of that was that he had many school exercise books that were empty. And it's in those school exercise books that he started to write his poetry. Some of them still exist, and they're in the Buffalo University in New York. And we have examples in that of Dylan's early work. He was very productive in those school exercise books. He did most of his writing in the smallest room in this house. And it is a bedroom that is probably one of the most important literary rooms in the UK. It's remarkable to think, if we see that bedroom, that so much work, that so much imagination and creativity and inspiration came out of such a small little box room. Number five, come because Dylan spent nearly two thirds of his life living in this one home, it meant that he spent that length of time in this one community. And being here for so long, he saw many, many different aspects of this community life over that period. That influence is clearly to be seen in his work. He really did listen to the way that people spoke to each other. He watched what was going on around him. You can see that in his prose, in the dialogues that, dialogue that he puts in. Uh, if you look at something as famous as Under Milk Wood, you, you know that this is a man who would listen to the way people said things. He knew their colour of saying. In saying that, in, in saying that two thirds of uh, what we have now published of Dylan's works was created in this house, that means finished work, but it also means drafts and notes towards ideas. And Under Milk Wood is another example. Uh, in 1931, there's a record of him talking to a grocer friend of his from this area down the road over there. Uh, and he's talking about an idea he had about describing 24 hours in the life of a town, the town that had gone mad. Uh, so that those were early ideas that he didn't actually write Under Milk Wood until 1953 when he'd long left Swansea. But the seeds were here. Dylan's uh, sister, Nancy, who was eight years older than him, was a regular performer with the Swansea Little Theatre. And at that time, they were based in the really popular, picturesque Mumbles area of Swansea. Uh, and she encouraged her little brother to go with her to the Swansea Little Theatre. And Dylan ended up performing in about 10 or 11 performances on stage, including uh, Hay Fever by Noel Coward. I'm sure that this was a big influence on a major aspect of Dylan's public work, which was the fact that he was a poet who performed his poetry. Dylan left school when he was 16 years old. He had a job on a local newspaper for a while. It didn't last very long because Dylan had the habit of, uh, if he didn't like a story, he'd change it. <laughs> so early indications that he was going to be a, a prose writer as well. Uh, but... At that time, when he was about 17, 18, he started to visit London uh, so that he could get familiar with the literary circles to start making contacts with the literary world. Dylan had been writing for some years before he went to London and he was very reluctant to show his work to anybody. And it was his grocer friend, Bert Trick, who said, Dylan, you've really got to do something with this. And thankfully, he listened to Bert Trick and thankfully Bert Trick was persistent enough and Dylan actually listened to him in the end, and he started to go to London. Uh, two volumes of his collected poems were published during, as a result of some of those visits to London, uh, while he still lived at this house. Uh, 18 poems and 25 poems both came out while Dylan was still living with his mum and dad. Who come dark in park, he speaks Out to play in Warnley's gang On one of his visits, to London from his home here 
Dolan met his wife-to-be. Uh, he was going to the Wheat Chief pub in Fitzrovia, just off Tottenham Court Road. And he walked into the pub and in the corner he saw a flame red-haired lady and he instantly fell for her. She was there with her boyfriend, her lover, the Welsh artist Augustus John. But that didn't put Dylan off. He went straight over to her. He put his head on her lap. He looked up into her eyes and said, You are beautiful. I love you. I'm going to marry you. With her boyfriend sitting next door. End of the night, after a few drinks, Dylan and Caitlin booked in to a hotel in London together. And they spent a week together. At the end of the week, Dylan sent the bill for the hotel to Augustus John. By which time, Dylan and Caitlin had left London, leaving Augustus with no option at all but to have to pay for his lover and her new boyfriend to have a nice time in London for a week. When Dylan was a little boy in this house, there was one particular characteristic of his life all through. He wasn't a very healthy child. He was quite often prone to illnesses and would miss a lot of school as a result. That kind of characteristic was still there right at back at the end of his life in 1953. When he made what proved to be his final visit to New York, he wasn't a well man. And uh, the fact that he'd taken so many engagements on, the fact that he had spoken in so many public places, that he'd performed his poetry, that he'd given lectures and talks, etc. And, of course, that he'd been to a few parties with, amongst others, Charlie Chaplin and, and Marilyn Monroe. All that did take its toll on a man who was not well at all. Dylan Thomas, in his own inimitable, <laughs> inimitable way, described his hometown as ugly, lovely Swansea. In the back bedroom of the home where he lived, you've got the vision of ugly and lovely Swansea through the two windows that are in that room. The main window would look out and down over Swansea, over the town of Swansea. And at the time Dylan lived here, that would have been full of heavy industry. Swansea was known as Copperopolis because it was a copper centre for the world at one time. That would have resulted in a lot of black and green smoke and smog. Add to that the coal industry. It would have been a fairly ugly sight. But the other window in the side of the house looks out over the stretching shore towards the Mumbles and out over the horizon. And I'm sure that the poet in Dylan would have looked out over that horizon and imagined worlds the other side that fueled his work. These days, Dylan Thomas's birthplace is a very busy and a very active place. There's quite a lot that goes on here. You can have a tour around the house, a guided tour around the house, either for an individual or for groups. We have regular events here, poetry, music, talks, a variety of things. You can have an Edwardian dinner party. And also, which is quite special, you can also stay here overnight. with relief all is well now it's revealed through the fallen wall we see